Terrific. Uh, look, just to start, the road that has uh, taken you to where you are now is is quite a story, and I don't, I don't think there would be any of your contemporaries in the music field that would have a story that mirrors yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's not... I don't really suggest... Uh, suggest it to everyone to take the unconventional back road to uh their goals but sometimes it's a necessary thing i mean yeah. for me uh there weren't a lot of opportunities in east los angeles there weren't a lot of talent scouts coming in and saying hey you chubby kid with the glasses come here and be a singer so uh i had to kind of carve my own uh destiny and uh luckily for me there weren't too many casualties along the way sure it's an amazing story have you ever been approached to, to put it into book form i'm actually writing a book i've, I've oh, you finished are. my 25th chapter this week i've been writing it for the last three years it's a it's a memoir and it'll probably be well right now it's tentatively called not just your not just your average uh fat illegitimate teenage plus size porn star welfare mom from East L.A. <laughs> <laughs> That's the tentative title. We'll see if uh, the publisher keeps it. I have a nice uh, agent in New York who's very optimistic that the book will do well, and um, so I'm excited about that. What a title. <laughs> it's been really hard to write. I mean, it's taken a long time, and it's been kind of a painstaking process, and it's been three years uh, in the making. You know, um, it's weird when you relive a lot of things. You kind of have nightmares, and uh, it, it's sort of like going through it all over again. So that that part was a little bit difficult, but but um, but overall, it's I think it'll be an interesting read for people. And there's a lot of interesting, um, you know, surprises in it. I mean, it wasn't just that I had an interesting life and was a stripper and a topless model and did videos and used my money to become a musician it was also that along the way i met a lot of famous people and had some famous people ask me for dates like gene simmons from kiss and courtney love is in my book because she used to live in my house and sleep with my boyfriend and so there's a lot of star quality in my book as well as as well as some titillating uh you know experiences Preparing for this interview and reading through other interviews with you, more often than not, it's your, your past that becomes the, the main focus of the article. Has that become a, a source of annoyance for you over the years? Well, I don't think it's... It's sort of a double-edged sword. I mean, in some ways, it gets me pressed in places that I normally wouldn't be. I mean, I'm probably the only blues singer who's been on the cover of, you know, the Gay and, Les the gay and Lesbian Times, <laughs> and I'm definitely the only blues singer that's played at the Hooker's Ball in San Francisco and the Fetish Balls and stuff like that. So I'm included in a lot of uh, fringy kind of um, festivals and, and unusual um, festivals uh, at the same time as playing some mainstream blues festivals. So for me, that's, that's gratifying and exciting. Um, but you know I, it's kind of impossible to not talk about i mean i've i've made it a a a, a very open um subject and i did that for many reasons i didn't want people to make up their own stories about it early on in my career there were a lot of people who said that i shouldn't talk about it and that i should keep it under my hat and and just say that it was in the past and that i've i've renounced my past and i've changed but I really felt like if I didn't talk about it, people would dig it up and talk about it anyway. Exactly. And, yeah. and so at least when I talk about it, I have the final say on what, what happened. And, and I would hate for people to come up with their own conclusions about it based on my silence. And so I really felt that it was better. The price that I've paid for that, obviously, is sometimes I walk a fine line between being, a no, a novel, be, being considered a novelty act and being taken seriously as a blues singer, which I think is kind of ironic because um, the, one of the reasons why I chose the blues as a genre and one of the reasons why I felt at home in the blues was because of its rich history of big women who were sexually provocative and who were uh, large-sized and, and powerful and outspoken. And, and so, it, um, so I felt right at home, but it seems that sometimes some of the really hardcore blues purists have a hard time understanding how 
someone like me fits into uh, the blues world, you know. So you go through that initial period of time uh, gaining acceptance and, and getting respect from, from the, the blues fraternity? Well, I think it still happens. I mean, it tends to be a very male-dominated, um, you know, uh, male-dominated field. And, um, you know, there's not a lot of, uh, old, you know, blues men talking about their past as sex workers or talking about being bisexual or or anything like that. So it's a little bit unusual uh, for some of the regular hardcore blues uh you know, establishment. I think the blues tends to be very male dominated and it tends to be a lot about drinking and hard living and maybe uh, they don't, uh, maybe sometimes they don't see how my story fits into that, but it certainly does. And, um, you know, I think it's, I think it still affects me in the, in the way that I don't get booked at like, uh, really solid blues festivals in say like Kansas City or Chicago. I play in Kansas City and Chicago, but I'm not playing like the Chicago Blues Festival or the Kansas City Blues Festival. I, I tend to be invited to blues festivals in in cities that I consider more progressive, cities where they're more, um, where they're not as uh, perhaps um, rigid about their uh, their blues. And so I've played the San Francisco Blues Festival and the Toronto Blues Festival and the um, you know, Monterey Blues Festival and, um, you know, festivals where maybe they have roots music and, and different kinds of music, not just hard blues, and they're not, um, they're not uh, as narrow. I mean, I think it's silly. I think that they should all give me a, give me a chance, and, and, I, and I wish they would, and I, I keep, I keep uh, holding on and hoping someday I'll get nominated for a Handy Award or somebody in the hardcore blues community will will realize that I really love this I love this music and I'm true to it but until then I'm very gratified and happy uh with uh, the the little niche I've carved for myself and and that's okay if I never get accepted by the hardcore blues community that's okay cuz I forged a real interesting audience of my own that that includes not only blues fans but you know rockabilly kids and gay women and feminists and bikers and men who like fat chicks and porn fans and strippers and you know just a real interesting cross-section of people so um i don't uh, i don't i don't really have regrets I, like i said it's a double-edged sword it's it's both a blessing and a curse so all through those years the career in music was always the ultimate goal for you always yeah. i mean i was a singer when i was a little girl um, you know, that was how, in fact, my book starts. I'm singing on the steps of the library in my neighborhood to strangers who are coming up the stairs to go to the library. My mom was an avid reader, and she went to the library once a week. And when I found out that I could get attention from singing from strangers, I was outside in front of that library singing all the time. I didn't go in and get books anymore. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to sing for people. And and I was involved in, uh, you know, singing in my church when I was a kid. I was the music director for the children's choir at my at my church, and um, and then I did a lot of community theater work, and I auditioned for a lot of community theater. But you know, I always lost. I never got the parts I wanted. I always lost to the skinny blondes who could sing like Julie Andrews and a beautiful high soprano. I was a chubby br brunette with glasses, and so with with and with huge knockers so i ended up getting the part of the grandma they'd throw a gray wig on me because i had big tits and uh and make me be the grandma you know and so i always wanted to play dorothy in the wizard of oz but instead i always got the part of the witch or something and it was and not the good witch not the pretty thin blonde witch but you know the scary witch because i looked more matronly than than uh than ingenue and so, um, so it was discouraging. It was a discouraging thing, and that's how I ended up, uh, you know, kind of putting music on hold. And I, I got pregnant young, and and like I said, there weren't a lot of people in East LA coming back and saying you can be successful at this. So I sort of did what I had to do to survive in the meanwhile. And fortunately for me, I made a lot of friends in the music uh, world. I mean, I, I lived in Highland, I lived in Highland Park, which is northeast Los Angeles. And it's very close to Hollywood, so I used to go to Hollywood at night and 
and see punk rock bands and I made friends with a lot of people in bands like Dave Alvin and uh, Dwight Yoakam and the guys from Los Lobos, Caesar and Dave and Conrad and you know um, it was a great time to be in music in the early 80s there was you know you could see Black Flag and Los Lobos and the Blasters and Dwight Yoakam all on one show it was real diverse musically and so because I had a real firm foundation in music when I went away to do sex work when I went away to strip or went away to do a photo shoot I came back and all my friends were musicians they were the people I hung out with for support they were the people who encouraged me um, I didn't really I, I considered the sex work more like a job it was like the the means to an end you know I could take the money from sex work and save it up and go in the studio and hire good musicians to play with me so it was always a goal uh, to be a musician and I had a, a lot of people who made me think that it could it could be possible plus in the 80s in LA being a sex worker was sort of like punk rock anarchy I mean I, I fit right into the whole anarchy um, ideal you know, I was bucking the system my own way. I, 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 everybody was sort of anti-major label, and everybody was sort of trying to have their own, you know, independent labels and their own fanzines, and we were all trying to create this scene of our own. And so uh, being a stripper and a, and a porn star was sort of uh, an unusual maverick way to, to uh, forge a music career. So I got a lot of support from the punks. And I felt, uh, you know, I felt like I was one of them, and that really helped me. I think it helped me avoid a lot of the pitfalls that uh, exist in, in sex work as well. I mean, it's not a rosy business. There's a lot of, you know, um, you know, a lot of things that happen in the sex business that aren't great things. And so I was able to sort of stay, steer clear of trouble because I had all these friends at home that were musicians, and I didn't really hang out too much with uh, the people who were frequenting the strip joints, you know. Talking about your, your on-stage persona, it's very prov provocative, as you said, and very out there. Do you think you, you would still be that same person on stage without that background in the sex industry? Well, I don't know. It's sort of like asking me who would I be if I had different parents or something. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't really know. Um, I, I really don't know. I mean, I, I know that... Uh, I've I've been able to be uh, I'm a little more uninhibited and a little more uh, frank and blunt because of my background and I don't know that I would have always been that way but my parents were they weren't real they were liberals but my my dad was a, a body painter in the 60s and he used to paint naked ladies on the beach and my dad also worked as a graphic artist for um, for some porn magazines and although he wasn't uh, very vocal about that job I found I found out about it by accident I went to work with him and he had uh, some stuff that he was doing on his drawing board and every time I came in the room he would cover it up with newspapers and so one time when he went to the bathroom I ran in and picked up the newspapers <laughs> and was astonished to see all kinds of people having sex in different positions and then my dad also uh, illustrated Bible coloring books. So I, I got all these coloring books for free where I could color Moses parting the Red Sea and Jesus on the cross. So I learned at an early age that religion and sex were acceptable ways to make money. And um, so I think that kind of subconsciously uh, affected some of the choices that I made, even though that's certainly not the only reason I went into sex work and it, it, it may have uh, it may have given me sort of an unspoken permission my parents were not happy though when I you know first started uh, adult adult work they didn't like it when I was on the cover of uh, my first magazine I was very proud and excited and I brought it home to show my mom and she was not happy about it at all and uh, I didn't really understand why uh, it was okay for my dad to paint naked ladies and do layout work for adult magazines, but it wasn't okay for me to pose naked for money. I didn't really understand why she was so um, negative about it. But years later, of course, having my own children, now I understand why she wanted more for me and why she was disappointed. But at that time, 
I was kind of puzzled about it. How heavy has the, the pressure been in the past for you from people in the industry to, to renounce your past? Pardon me? You mentioned before there'd been some pressure on you in the past to renounce your, your past. Yes. How heavy has well, that pressure been from various people in the industry? It, it happened more in, in country music. In the very beginning, I started out as a country singer, um, and I was uh, playing a lot in L.A. during the sort of uh, country. There was this whole Bakersfield country resurgence in L.A. that Dwight Yoakam was part of, and uh, there was a bunch of other people that came out of uh, that time, like Jim Lauderdale and Rosie Flores and... James Enfield and a bunch of us were country people and so I sang country and my manager then was Sherman Halsey who was also Dwight Yoakam's manager and uh, the famous speech that he gave me about losing weight and not be so controversial and don't talk about my past and blah 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 he's really the guy who pressured me uh, and told me that I shouldn't talk about my past um, I haven't felt that pressure as much in uh, in the blues world. It's been more, um, I mean, even my first record deal with Antones, Clifford Antone said, you know, you don't have to talk about it. He said, you can talk about it if you want to, he said, but you don't have to. He said, I was in jail, and people ask me sometimes about being in jail, and I just say I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> but the difference between Clifford and me is, Possibly, I'm not ashamed of what I did. If I had it to do all over again, I'd do the same thing. There may be some things I'd do differently. I don't think that I, I don't think I uh, would do videos if I had it to do over again. I wouldn't do any video work. I would just do magazine work. But, um, but that's the only thing that perhaps I would change. I think that everything I did shaped who I am, and that it was a necessary stepping stone to be who I am. I don't know that I would have the the strength and the and the uh, ability to get on stage and be myself completely and share myself with people if I hadn't gone through some of those things. What would you consider to be your first real break in, in the music career? Well, I was on a I was on a um my very first uh record uh, contract was in 1986 when I got signed to CBS Epic. It was a developmental record deal, and that was the record deal where they were telling me that I needed to clean up my act and not be so controversial and not talk about my past and blah, blah, blah. Ultimately, I lost that record deal, um, and, and mostly one of the reasons I lost it was because the day that we were supposed to go in and sign this big record deal, I came out on the cover of Jugs. <laughs> and my manager was really freaked out, and he said, I told you, you know, not to do this, and I, the record company hadn't seen it, but he felt that he was compromised. Uh, I guess he was trying to sell me to them as a uh, born-again Christian who had, you know, changed my ways, and here I was on the cover of Jugs, so he was not very happy about it. And um, and he subsequently dropped me as my as my manager. So that was my first big break. But it was almost the end of my career. As it was almost the beginning and the end, because I was so devastated after losing that record deal that I I swore that I wouldn't uh, that I wouldn't do it anymore. I swore that I was just gonna be a songwriter and I wasn't going to pursue music as a career. And I ended up getting pregnant with uh, with my second son, Tommy. And I didn't uh, really try after that to get a record deal until Tommy was a little bit older. And then I started going to uh, Austin and playing in Austin a lot, and that's how I met Susan Antone, Clifford's sister, and we became good friends. And she is the one who, uh, you know, encouraged Clifford to sign me to the label. So um, really the CBS Epic thing was the first big thing that happened to me. That was my first taste of you know, what could happen. That was the first time I'd been in a recording studio and saw gold records, the first time I held a Grammy, the first time I, you know, uh, I went, I got flown to Nashville and they had a white limo waiting for me and took me to meet Billy Sherrill because he was going to produce my record. And that was a real big uh, splash for me, um, being a girl from East L.A. That was, that was the first time that I thought, you know what, this has worked. Whatever I'd done in the sex business, I felt it had worked because I was, you know, getting the limo treatment and was in Nashville and being treated like a star. But it wasn't directly because of the sex business. It was just sort of 
but the sex business had directly facilitated my career because the sex business is what made me able to make demos and without those demos no one would have ever heard of me so um it's 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 strange and 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 ironic how the path sort of through you know twists and turns ended up where exactly where i wanted it to end up to begin with Yeah, I'm doing an interview with Australia now. I'll be done in a minute. But yes, to predict is to tell the future. P R E D I C T. I'm sorry, that's my son. He's doing his homework. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> Nate, you mentioned you had some time at Antone's Records, and you've been on a few labels. Has it been unsettling at all not being able to stay put for too long with one label? Well, I would have loved to stay longer with Rounder. I really thought that Rounder was going to be my home for a long time, and I was really... Uh, crushed when they uh, when they dropped me from Rounder. Um, Rounder had a uh, you know had such a uh, a huge roster, and they have so many people in their catalog uh, that I think they just finally broke under the pressure and had to really cut back. And unfortunately, I was there at that time because I had really hoped that I would be able to stay with Rounder for a long time, and I also hoped that Rounder would be the label that would let me do you know, all the different kinds of records I'd like to do because I, I, I am going to, I am doing a solid blues record next time, but I also would like to do a record of, I'd like to do a country record. I'm a really good yodeler and I'd like to yodel on record and have that. And I'd like to do a record of standards. I love singing jazz standards like Ella Fitzgerald style standards. And I do a jazz show every Thursday night here in the States when I'm at home and it's a lot of fun just with a piano trio and I really love that style and I'm very good at it so and I'd like to do a gospel record with uh, different kinds of spirituals from every faith and I'd like to do a, a language record with you know French and German and Spanish and um, Hebrew and a lot of the different languages that I've learned through my travels and um, and I hoped that Rounder was going to be the place to do that unfortunately it didn't happen but I still feel, I mean, I, I can't complain. I mean, I'm really lucky. I'm really, I'm still working, and there's a lot of people that aren't. And the record business is constantly changing, and as long as I can stay afloat, you know, I, I will. And, and hopefully, even if my record, my recording career stopped today and I didn't have any more chances to make records, I feel very fortunate. I've traveled all over the world. I've taken my kids all over the world with me. And I've garnered enough experience to be able to write a 25-chapter book. So mm -hmm. I feel pretty good about things, and, and I hope that I hope things continue. But if they don't, I think I'll always be able to find a, a way to survive because I'm a survivor. Sure. I believe your son's been a member of your band, too. Is that right? My oldest son yeah. is uh, my drummer. Yes, he's, he's my drummer. And my youngest son is still a student. Uh, but both of them are very musical. My my uh, oldest one plays guitar and he plays drums in my group, and he's a, he writes songs and he's very talented. And my youngest is uh, plays trom trombone and piano and guitar and string bass. And he's my my youngest is my son with Tom Yearsley from the Paladins. Yep. And my oldest was raised with Tom as his dad, but his natural father is deceased. Are you bringing your your full band down with you? Can you come down yes. here? You are fantastic. There's a the great element of fun in your music and, and your live show. Do, do you think sometimes the whole music business takes itself a, a little bit too seriously? I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it's only music. We're supposed to have fun. Yeah. Um, and and that's why I think it's uh, it's uh, it's weird sometimes to be snubbed by the solid blues guys. I mean, you would think they would want to see someone who's unusual. I mean, I see so many blues festival uh, lineups where it's all guys, you know, and I mean, no offense to the guys, but it's nice to see a woman on there, you know. Right now, the, the big blues festival that's coming up is the uh, the Rhythm and Blue, the, uh, what's it called, the um, Rhythm and Blues Cruise. Oh, ah, yes. Little, little Charlie's on it, and there's a wonderful lineup, and there's only one woman, Shamikia. Everybody else is male on that on that cruise. There's probably 25 acts, and all of them are guys except for Shamikia. And I just think it's it's a shame. I mean, there's a lot of female talent out there, and and you know when you're when you're on a blues cruise and you're seeing 
you know, 25 bands, and most of them are the same thing, guitar, harmonica, you know, bass and drums, why not throw some women on there? It's going to make it far more interesting. Yeah, for sure. I just think it's fun to watch women perform and, and play instruments, and it's uh, it's definitely a little detour from the same, you know, four-piece blues band. I just think it's a, it's a no-brainer, and I don't understand why... Uh, blues festivals don't do that more that's why i really loved the byron bay blues festival when i got to do it it was really a lot of fun it was so eclectic and there were so many different kinds of acts on it it was just really refreshing to be on a festival with so many different kinds of people and i really i really think that's wonderful and i wish more festivals would be uh imaginative that way they really do pride themselves on their diversity with that festival and they do a great job with it yeah, it's, yeah. I, and i think it's good i mean i think it it, it brings everyone together everyone comes for a different musician but many of them leave with a common denominator with other people that they thought they didn't have and that's what's wonderful about it if music has the potential to be such a powerful unifier and it's it's the, it's something that everyone in the world can relate to everyone's been affected or uplifted by a song in their lives whether it's a religious song or whatever it is even in countries I mean, I think significantly in countries like Iran, where, where, where all music is banned except for religious music, they're banning that music for a reason, because they know that the music is powerful and can move people. Or they wouldn't move to ban it, you know? It, it, it wouldn't be necessary. And so I think that with music, having such wonderful potential to unite people, it's a shame to just, you know, stick with one style all the time it's 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 uh it's much better to bring people together who think that they're only rock fans or who think that they're only blues fans and have them discover that actually they loved the bluegrass band or they loved you know the you know funk band or the hip-hop band you know i mean that's i think that's just really a wonderful thing to 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 discover where would um where would your best markets be outside of the states um, well, for years it was France. I mean, the French, I had a really wonderful agent in France, and I played in France for, for many years in every festival and every small town and all over the place. And um, I really loved it. And uh, I, I, I even recorded a couple of songs in French um, as a tribute to my French fans. Um, but now I think uh, Europe just tends to be really wonderful about this kind of music. We'll see where it goes. Uh, I hope that things don't change with the war and people being sort of anti-American right now in Europe. I hope that it doesn't change the music. But for years, Europe has been the best uh, the best market for me. I've toured Europe, you know, twice or three times a year for almost 10 years now. So, I mean, uh, they treat us differently there. They they value the music more. It's it's different in the states. Music in the states is kind of um, it's always the first thing cut from the school budget, you know. And music here is really more of a a sort of entertainment, um, you know. Uh, it's sort of a last priority. I mean, if you're broke, music's going to be the first thing you cut from your budget. And in Europe, it, the shows tend to be sponsored by the government or sponsored by the community centers or by the state. And, and so as a result, you get all kinds of people, the whole families coming with their grandparents and their grandchildren and everyone coming to the concert. And so it's, it's much more of an important, meaningful part of their lives than it is here in the States. And I fear for live music. I think that there's a lot of distractions right now and I, I worry that live music could um, could become obsolete and go the way of the 8-track player you know um, I heard that they're going to um, that they've invented a virtual band that you can program in your own house and that the virtual band will play whatever style you want mm -hmm. so you can program in your computer that you want the band to play reggae or you want the band to play you know, blues, and the band will play it, and it'll be a virtual band where you can control the people, 
and their characters, just like something like the Sims game, but with, you know, musicians. And I just think that's scary because, and especially in the U.S. where they have all these terror alerts and they're trying to scare people out of going places because there's terrorists. I mean, what better threat to music is there than to, you know, scare people into staying home and then create a virtual band yeah. so that people don't even need to see live musicians. They can just have a fake band right in their own house that'll oh. play whatever they want. <laughs> That's so, horrible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's scary, but it, but unfortunately, it, it's, it's reality. Oh. And so I really think now more than ever, when people go to see live music, they're they're doing a public service and they're not only keeping some bartenders you know working but they're keeping musicians working and, and it's really important because there's so many threats to live music with the internet and with virtual bands and with downloading and with so many entertainment options people don't need to go to see musicians and i don't i don't want to you know slag djs but djs too i mean it's it's disheartening when you're a musician and you're playing in a club to 40 people and then you stop and they open the club up for the disco and there's 150 people in line to get in for the disco mm. it's just it's it's you know you just wonder well wh why am i doing this what what is the point you know it's really hard to keep your your uh to keep your perspective when stuff like that is happening and i see it getting worse not better maybe i'm wrong i hope i'm wrong oh, i hope so too <laughs> <laughs> and i've just about ran out of studio time so i'll have to let you go just to finish up what would be the the best piece of advice you could give to someone who was in the same position as you all those years ago and, and with a dream to get out and, and achieve something else with their lives well i think the most important thing in in life is to remember that whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger number one yeah and number two you have to really learn to be a human bullshit filter <laughs> and filter out all the negative crap that you're fed by people in your life people in the media and perfect strangers uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of negativity in the world telling you that you're not good enough that you're not uh, pretty enough you're not thin enough you're not strong enough I mean, for men and women, there's this pressure to be and look and act a certain way. And I think if you can learn to sort of filter that stuff out and just really follow your your heart and your dream and and also keep the the that sort of uh, that spontaneity that children have. Children have this wonderful spontaneity and this lack of fear. They'll just go up to people and talk to them, and they're curious and inquisitive, and they they don't think about things all the time. They don't overthink it. They just go and do it. And that's a really important quality to keep whatever your job is. If you can keep that inquisitive nature and, and keep, you know, uh, filtering out the negative, I think you can accomplish so much more and, and not give up. Outstanding advice. Andy, thanks so much for your time today. It's much appreciated. Oh, I'm glad we finally hooked yeah. up. I was getting nervous. I'm sorry that I missed your first couple calls. Not a problem at all. Have a safe trip down here, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in a few weeks' time.